So today, um, it's another touchy subject, okay? Turn to your neighbor and say, get ready. Get ready. Get ready. Now turn to the other one that you thought was the other candidate choice. No, I'm just kidding. Hey, it's, we're, we're talking about the Christian in politics today. The Christian and politics, because this is an area that needs the truth of God's word desperately shined on it. And I wanted to bring you a little something special today. I know what you're thinking. Oh my goodness, oh my goodness. What kind, of, what kind of political show is going on in the church today? Isn't it funny how like these signs and fabric can cause such a triggered emotional response by you? Immediately when I brought this one out and this one out, your feelings change. They, 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 they depend on which one I would hold up and I can't do that because then someone's gonna screenshot one of them and be like, oh, he's for that candidate. I mean, it's funny how a piece of fabric or cardboard can change our mood in an instant. And here's why. Because it's more than a slogan. It's more than a hat. It's more than a name, you guys. It's, it's a, they represent a set of values. They represent a set of fears and hopes and for our future. But we live in a world that's constantly trying to call us to choose sides. But for those of us who follow Jesus, our allegiance isn't to a party. It's to a king. For the Christian, our hope isn't grounded in politics. It's anchored in the unshakable person of Jesus Christ. And today what I want to do is help you see through the lens of the word of God, not through the lens of your political candidate. I should probably clarify what a Christian is though. Okay, we talk about being a Christian and okay, being a Christian means something more than a label. It means you've repented of your sins, you've received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, and you live under his lordship. We don't follow him halfway or on our own terms. His values becomes our values. His word becomes our blueprint. And as believers, our approach to politics should never be driven by family tradition or popularity or personalities of candidates. It should be shaped by a biblical conviction. In Matthew 6, 33, he says, Jesus says, but seek first democracy. But seek first politics. No, no, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these will be given to you as well. The word of God is not a suggestion. It's our foundation. His kingdom stands higher than any earthly alignment, higher than any political platform. So when we go to the ballot box, we're not casting a vote for popularity or personality or family tradition. We're casting our vote for conviction, for eternity, and for kingdom truth. If we say we're followers of Christ, then we have to let his values shape everything in our life, and that includes our political choices. Some people think, though, even the title of this sermon, like Christian and politics, like those two don't even mix because for a lot of people, politics is a dirty word. It's a bad word. It's gross. It's corrupt. And no doubt it is all of that today. But I believe that this is an area of our life in our society that needs the light of God's truth to be shined upon it. Write this key truth down, though. Government is God's idea. See, it's not, it's not, government is not a human invention or a societal construct. It's actually part of the fabric of creation ordained by God to bring order, protection, and purpose. So when we engage with government in any form, we're engaging, listen to me, with a structure that God has set in place. So today, here's what I want to do. Here's my like thesis for the journey today. And I would hope that you would disarm yourself and let's go on a journey through the word of God and you can rebuttal all you want afterwards. But if you would just put down the walls and just let's go, let me just tell you where we're going in the journey. I want to show you today first how governance was God's idea. And I believe many of us don't treat it right because we don't see it right. Well, what does God say about governance and government? We're going to first learn that. Then we're going to respond to some of the things that culture is saying Christians should or shouldn't do as it pertains to politics. And we're going to answer those questions. Then I'm going to wrap it up with a biblical approach to politics. That's the thesis today. Y'all ready for this? Okay. First, we need to understand that governing and governance was God's idea. God created government in three spheres. Each one has its own God-given authority and purpose. It's very important to understand this as a foundation. Number one is this. The first sphere of governance that God created is in the family. Government 
starts in the home. Our first experience with authority, with guidance, and discipline begins in the family. Look at Ephesians chapter 6 says, children, obey your parents in the Lord. And all the parents said, amen. amen. Someone already beat me to it. He said, hallelujah. Honor your father and your mother, which is the first commandment with the promise, so that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. The family is the first government, the first authority structure that God ordained. Parents are called to lead their children, not be their best friends, to instill values and pass down the truths of God. When children honor their parents, they're learning how to honor God. This is why parents, for you not to teach your children how to honor your authority, you're doing a disservice to them in their relationship with God. And this is why, by the way, the enemy attacks the nuclear family so much today, a husband and wife having children. This is why, because it is the foundation of the governance of God. The family is the first sphere of God's government. The second sphere, write it down, is in the church. Just as parents are called to guide and nurture their children, God actually places leaders who are gifted within his church to guide and shepherd his people. Look at Hebrews 13, verse 17 says, it says, have confidence in your leaders and submit to their authority because they keep watch over you as those who must give an account. Do this that their work will be a joy, not a burden, for that would be no benefit to you. So in the church, leadership isn't about power, it's about stewardship. Your, your leaders aren't just watching over you, they're accountable to God for you. And when you submit to the authority of your pastors, your spiritual leaders, you're not just submitting blindly, you're aligning yourself with the structure God has ordained. In Ephesians chapter four, it's not in your notes, but it says that God gave himself some leadership structure, the, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip God's people for works of service. This is God's blueprint for the church, a place where leaders can serve with joy, not weighed down by unnecessary burdens, knowing that their authority is respected. And it's not just for their benefit, it's actually for yours, the Bible says. So, so if God created government in the family, and he created government, and he shows governance and authority within the church, it's no surprise then that he also designed authority for the broader society. Write that down in, that that's the third sphere, in society. Our faith isn't just confined to personal spaces and church buildings. No, our faith has implications for our communities, our cities, and our nations. In Romans chapter 13, the apostle Paul says it like this, let everyone be subject to the governing authorities for their, look what it says, there is no authority except that which God has established. So no matter what happens in this election, if you're a Christian, you cannot say, not my president. You are dishonoring the authority of God. You are, you, you are going against the structure, the governance, the authority, even if it's not your candidate, he or she will be your president. Ooh, that hurts right now. Oh. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, whoever rebels against the authority, look, is rebelling against what God has instituted. And those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. See, all authority, whether in the family, in church, or, or government, is under God's sovereignty. This is so hard for some people to accept, especially when we see imperf imperfections in those systems right? But, but we have to understand the authority is, is given by God. He is the one who gives that authority. That governance was created by God, but how they exercise that authority is not from God all the time. Whether that's in government or family, God gives the authority to a parent. It is a God-ordained authority as a parent to be given to a father or a mother, but how that father parents his children sometimes can be evil and abusive. He is dishonoring the authority that God has given him. But the authority is from God. The structure, the governance is a model that God established that we have to understand. This is God created governance. Now, one of the most common ways we express rebellion to authority is not how you would think, it's actually through passivity. We think rebellion is loud, it's obvious, defiance, but it often starts with this subtle avoidance. Imagine you're calling your kids to the dinner table. You got several kids, but one of your kids stays in the room playing their games. They hear you, but they don't come out several times. Is that child rebelling against you? 
Yes, absolutely. It's passive rebellion. It's a choice to opt out of the authority that they're under in the same way when we ignore our societal responsibilities, dismissing civic engagement as irrelevant. It's a choice to opt out of the authority that we are under. We're stepping away from God's intention for us to be active, engaged citizens. Rebellion doesn't always look like confrontation. Sometimes it looks like indifference. And as believers, we're called to not just avoid wrong, but to actively pursue right. It's God's God established governance for society. And that's why, that's why we actually had established, you know, years ago, the Pledge of Allegiance. You know, the Pledge of Allegiance isn't just a patriotic statement. It is rooted in the fabric of God's relationship with nations. It, it, is, it is biblical for us as citizens of this nation to want the highest good and righteousness and justice for this nation. It's biblical, you guys. Throughout the Bible, God establishes covenants with nations and chooses to honor, that choose to honor him. Psalm 33, verse 12 says, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. See, this isn't about like Christian nationalism that they want you to believe. It's about our desire and devotion for our country to live under the blessing, the favor, and the lordship of King Jesus. Now, this brings me to what our culture is trying to tell you, what you should and shouldn't do as a Christian in the political and government realm. Okay, let's start with what they're saying you should do. Write this down. You might hear culture say, you should keep your religion out of politics. You should keep your religion. Let's get something straight that it's often misunderstood. The separation of church and state doesn't mean faith stays behind church walls or that we leave our convictions at home when we go to the voting ballot box. The phrase was never meant to keep believers silent. Check this out. The separation of church and state is actually there to protect us from government interference. It's a boundary that prevents the government from dictating what I teach, what we believe, what we stand for. It means the government has no say over the message and can't tamper with the church's mission. That's what the separation of church and state is for. But what happens when the government starts crossing that line and wants to silence us and put us in a box? What happens when it tries to label biblical truth as discriminatory? Like right now, it's, it's unthinkable that some might call the truth in this very series that we've been discussing divisive or even offensive. But here's the reality check. Truth has never fit in with popular culture. Truth isn't to make us comfortable. It's there to set us free. And, and if you've tempted and you're tempted to think, well, the Bible is not a political book, though. We shouldn't like put that, bring that into politics. Let me ask you this. How do you explain Moses standing toe to toe with Pharaoh? declaring God's word to be the most powerful ruler on earth? How do we make sense of Esther risking her life before the king to save her people? This isn't just biblical history. It's a model of faith intersecting with governance. The Bible is not a political book, but it speaks a lot to politics. There are multiple books about governance. First and second Kings, first and second Chronicles, the book of Judges. When John the Baptist confronted Herod, he wasn't meddling in politics. He was calling out sin and a public leader who was accountable to God. He was saying right is right and wrong is wrong, no matter how powerful the person in question might be. See, this has been true all throughout history even. Think of Dietrich Bonhoeffer a Nazi, in Nazi Germany, a German pastor and theologian. Bonhoeffer stood against the regime that tried to twist the church and create it in its own image, a regime that demanded loyalty and integrity, the silence over truth. Bonhoeffer refused to bow and he stood up for, for truth and he paid for it with his life. But his voice still speaks to us today as a reminder, we don't go to get to stay silent in the face of evil. In fact, he's quoted with this, silence in the face of evil is itself evil. God will not hold us guiltless. Not to speak is to speak. Not to act is to act. Consider Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., whose leadership in the civil rights movement was rooted in biblical convictions of justice and equality in the face of laws that treated people unfairly. Dr. King declared, God's word says, and his voice grounded in faith shook the foundations of a systemic issue of injustice. He actually was quoted with this, our lives begin to end the day we become silent about things that matter. I wonder, would we have had the courage to speak up alongside Dr. Martin Luther King? Would we have stayed quiet, hiding behind, it's not our place? 
See, when a nation veers away from God's will, it's time for men and women to stand up and speak out. The Bible has always had leaders and prophets, men and women willing to declare the truth in a world that doesn't always want to hear the truth. Whether that's Nathan confronting David or Elijah standing against the prophets of Baal or Isaiah calling out a nation's sins, these are the voices that refuse to bow to popular culture. So when people say, keep your religion out of politics, remember this, faith isn't a hobby we pick up on weekends. It's the lens through which we see the world. And when that lens reveals injustice, sin, or deception, we don't have the luxury of silence, church. Just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were called to respectfully but resolutely stand their ground, we're called to do the same. Look at Daniel chapter three. It says, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they replied to King Nebuchadnezzar, We don't need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the burning furnace, they were were demanded to worship this image, this, this idol, and they would not bow to what everyone else was bowing to and worshiping. He says, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you've set up. See, they didn't didn't back down because they knew their allegiance wasn't negotiable. They were respectful, but they were resolute, showing us that faithfulness means standing firm even when the outcome isn't guaranteed, church. This kind of courage is what we're called to today. The world demands we compromise. We We need to be people who say, even if God doesn't rescue us in the way we hope, we're not bowing down to anything less than him. Here's, here's the other. That's what culture might be saying we should do. Here's one that culture's saying you shouldn't do. They'll, you might have heard, you shouldn't vote for such an immoral candidate. You shouldn't vote, by the way. They're all immoral, so what are you going to do? What are you going to do here? Scripture gives us a different perspective on leadership and discernment. God's measure of a leader goes so far beyond the surface level. First Kings chapter 16, verse 7 says, The Lord says to Samuel, do not consider his appearance. I don't care what color they are, what gender they are, what person. Don't look at the appearance. Don't vote just because she's a girl. Don't vote because he's a man. Don't vote because she's black. Don't vote because she's white. Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. We're not speaking, seeking perfection, our leaders, because only God holds that standard. Instead, we're called to look beyond the appearance and evaluate the heart and the values behind the candidates. See, voting isn't about selecting a pastor. You know, it, I have qualify, like there are biblical qualifications that I am held to, that, that, that you're not held to, by the way. If I violate some of those biblical standards, like you can violate them and you're fine, but if I violate them, I lose my job. There's a higher standard. To, 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 so, so it's about choosing someone whose values align as closely as possible with biblical truth. But listen, the ballot box, please hear me, it's not a mailbox to send a message. Okay, some people are like, I'm, not, I'm, I'm gonna write in a third candidate. Pastor Jason, I'm writing in you. Please don't write in me. <laughs> why, why use your ballot to send a message if no one's going to read it? Don't send a message. Our goal isn't to make a statement, it's to make a difference. But we need to understand there's something else that a vote is not. A vote isn't a valentine. A vote isn't a valentine. You don't have to love the person. In fact, let me give you, there's there's three types of leaders in the Bible, okay? And it's important that we see this, okay? There's three types of leaders biblically. There's three types of leaders in this world. Every candidate election, every, there'll be three types of leaders that we have to choose from. The first type are those who embrace, celebrate, and promote righteousness. These leaders, they're actively pursuing what is right, following God's principles with integrity. Think of King David, a man after God's own heart who pursued righteousness and sought to lead Israel in a way that honored God. He wasn't perfect, but David's primary aim was to bring honor to God, okay? The second type of leaders are those who embrace, celebrate, and promote unrighteousness, On the other side, some leaders turn their power toward promoting what's contrary to God's word. Think of King Ahab and Queen Jezebel, clear examples. They embraced idolatry, pursued 
wickedness. They led Israel astray into sin with no desire to align their will and the nation's will to God's desires and heart and law. King, King Ahab and Queen Jezebel's leadership was marked by compromise, corruption, and directly opposing God's ways. Those are two types of leaders. But what a lot of people don't understand is there actually is a third type of leader in the Bible. There's a third type of leader in the world. There's a third type of leader when you go vote. There's a third type of leader. Write it down. Those who are flawed, but used for good. Those who are flawed, but used for good. There are leaders who God uses for good despite their flaws. King Jehu is a perfect example of this. Jehu was chosen by God to execute justice on the house of Ahab and against Jezebel, wiping out idolatry and corruption. He zealously fulfilled the mission, removing false worship and bringing reform to Israel. But Jehu himself was not fully loyal to God. He allowed idolatry to persist. He failed to walk before God faithfully and in instituting all of God's laws, decrees, and principles. But Jehu was used by God for a specific purpose, even though his character ultimately fall, fell short of God's standard. See, I wish we had a King David on the ballot or a King Jesus on the ballot, but the reality is we don't. Jesus isn't on the ballot, but Jezebel is. See, our choice in the United States is between Jehu and Jezebel. I'll let you make your inference. Will you write this down in your notes somewhere? Write this down. It's not ideal to vote for the lesser of two evils but it's never permissible, child of God, to vote for the greater of two evils. As we choose our leaders, we gotta align our decisions with those who most closely reflect the heart and truth of God. So with all this in mind, God's structure of authority, the types of leaders we encounter, our responsibility of as believers, the question becomes how should we as Christian approach politics? What is a biblical approach then to politics? Okay, I'm going to give you some resources on the screen because I didn't have enough room in your notes to put it on your notes, the QR code. If you want to actually watch some more, read some more, learn some more, there's resources on the, and it's not candidate-based, it's just Bible-based, by the way, okay? It's Bible-based resources if you want to take a look at that. See, but when, when even I ask, like, what's a biblical approach to politics, the politics in the biblical times was vastly different from what we experience in a democratic republic, and we have to understand this. In the ancient world, people lived mostly under monarchs and kings and tribal rule, but this concept of a citizen-driven government where voting rights, it didn't exist in biblical times, you guys. But Jesus himself said this in Matthew chapter 2, not in your notes, render to Caesar what is Caesar's, which, which showed respect for the governing authorities, even though they were corrupt and oppressive. Now, in a democratic republic, listen, we have a voice and the ability to influence our leaders, to influence our laws. That's a radical shift from anything that the early Christian church knew. And in our rendering unto Caesar has actually extended now to include voting. That's actually part of rendering unto Caesar. It's voting, participating in public discourse, holding leaders accountable. This is a significant responsibility as we steward not only our personal faith, but also the freedoms that allow us to live out our faith publicly. Imagine, imagine if the disciples or the early Christians had that kind of responsibility. I believe if they had this responsibility of stewarding a vote, they would have seen it and viewed it with such reverence. They would have seen it as an opportunity to reflect God's values on societies. I believe the early church, the disciples would encourage us to vote as a way to seek justice, love mercy, and walk humbly before our God, according to Micah chapter six, verse eight. Here's the reality. Sin isn't whispering in our culture anymore, is it? There was a time that it used to whisper, but right now it's shouting. It's calling good evil and evil good. Now, the Bible says this in 2 Chronicles 7, 14. If my people, God says, who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin and I will heal their land. You see, healing in our land is not dependent on the sinner repenting. It's dependent on the church repenting. If my people, he says, who are called by my name, all the evil and the corruption that's going on happen under the church's watch. That we see in the world, it happened on our watch. 
What's happening to our children in schools? What's happening in education? What's happening in politics? What's happening in our city? It happened on our watch. And it would be ignorant for us to just check it off as, oh, those are just signs of the time. The times are a sign of the condition of the church. Darkness prevails in the absence of light. Let me give you a biblical approach then. To politics, church. What's our approach to politics as as followers of Jesus, under the lordship of Jesus? Number one, I got to put my identity in Christ, not a political party. You see, you give your vote to the most qualified candidate, but give your heart to the most high God. Okay, I I do not ascribe. This is why when when people ask me about my political party, I say I'm a kingdom independent. Me, every election, I ask myself the question, who and what aligns most with the kingdom of heaven? I don't attach my identity to the label of this world, to a right or to a left. I am a citizen of heaven, and I'm going to vote according to that value. Look what it says in 2 Corinthians 5, by the way, verse 17 and 20. It says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, so I'm, I'm dead, my old life is gone, I'm in Christ now, The new creation has come, the old is gone, and the new is here. Look what he says, verse 20. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God, look what he wants to do. He wants to actually make an appeal through you to this world. Did you know ambassador is a political term? That is a political term. I don't speak on my own accord, on my own authority. I've been given representative authority to bring the kingdom reign of Jesus and his righteousness to earth. God has given me that responsibility. Listen, church, if we talk more about politics than the principles of God's word, or if we talk more about candidates than of Christ, or if we read and watch and listen to news outlets more than we consume the truth of God's word, then we're anchoring our hope in the wrong place. If you hate someone because of their political affiliation, because of their bumper sticker, because of their yard sign, or because of their hat, I'm telling you, your heart's in the wrong place. My hope is not in a candidate. My hope is in Jesus Christ. See, Jesus said, hey, pray this way. Pray like this. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. As ambassadors of Christ, we are not called to passively stand by as darkness and corruption and confusion and deception rule our nation and society. We are called to engage as ambassadors of the kingdom of heaven, influencing the kingdom of heaven on earth. See, the kingdom of hell will use politicians and people as pawns. And even Christians who are blinded by deception to the truth to advance hell's dominion and hell's darkness. The biblical approach to politics is first to put our identity in Christ, not a political party. Number two, we are called to be salt and light to the earth. See, salt has one job, to preserve and bring flavor in a way that keeps something from decaying, food from decaying. Light has one job as well, to reveal truth and to expose what is hidden in darkness. See, when Jesus calls us to be salt and light, He's calling us to bring truth, preservation, and clarity to every part of society, including politics. Look what he says in Matthew 6. Jesus says, you're the salt of the earth. He's talking to the the Christian. You are the the child of God. You are the salt of the earth. But if you, you lose your saltiness, if you check out and you stop being the preservation agent in the world that you live in, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything. Jesus said, you're good for nothing if you check out and don't engage and actively uh, uh, preserve the, the people, the nations, the communities that you are around. You're no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled on. See, just as salt keeps food from spoiling, believers are called to be the moral preservative in a world that desperately needs it. See, this means we can't stay silent. When we see injustice and deception and brokenness, we're here to stand against moral decay and speak up for righteousness. He said, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill can't be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. See, light doesn't hide, it exposes. That's what you're called to be, not hidden, but to expose darkness, to expose lies, to expose deception. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. In a culture that loves the shadows, we're called to shine brightly. 
letting our actions, letting our words reflect God's heart. See, salt without taste is useless, and light that's hidden serves no purpose. We're here to influence the world, not to be influenced by it. Let our light shine in a way that glorifies our Father in heaven, being immovable in our commitment to advance righteousness, compassion. Number three, what's a biblical approach to politics? Number three, vote for my biblical convictions. Okay, not, not your family tradition, not what house that you were raised under and what they believe, not personality, who you like and who you don't like. I don't care who you like. God doesn't care who you get along with and I don't like the way, no, no, no. It don't, no, it's not about personality. It's not about popularity, what culture says or what which station says. It's about the biblical convictions. It's about the word of God. I need to vote my biblical convictions. When it comes to the issues that matter most, we hold some things with an open hand, right? And there are other things that are closed fish issues. There's like no debate. The core convictions that must like guide our decisions as followers of Christ. Decisions like the sanctity of life. That is a closed fish issue. This issue, there is no debate. This, this isn't a stance, it's scripture. Life is sacred from conception and we honor God's command to protect it. Our, our biblical convictions like marriage and family. God designed marriage as a covenant between one man and one woman and we stand firm against anything that tries to deconstruct or devalue family or gender. Male and female, created by God, defined by God, not up for revision. Okay, that's a biblical conviction. Our religious freedoms, let's be clear. What we're preaching today might someday soon be called hate speech. If that happens, church, don't fear. Don't flinch. In a persecuted place, the church isn't shrinking, it's exploding. In China, in Iraq, in the Middle East, you guys, when you thought you could bury us, all you did was plant us. See, the pulpit, this message, and this messenger, they're not for sale no matter what they say, okay? But I'm gonna vote for religious freedom. That's a biblical conviction. Another biblical conviction is equality for all. Equal rights for all people. Justice for all people, regardless of race or socioeconomic background. But true equality also means protecting women's spaces from unfair competition in the name of the same inclusivity. Don't sacrifice common sense on the altar of ideology. Okay, DEI is not equality, it's exclusion. Our our biblical conviction is the sovereignty of our borders. Boundaries matter. Broken doors lead to broken safety. God established nations and strong borders to protect the people within them. Another biblical conviction, the integrity of the candidate. We choose leaders who aim for truth, not just popularity. It's about character, not charisma. Or, or how about this biblical conviction? The stewardship of the planet. God has given us to steward, and we need to be stewards of this planet. But God gave us dominion, not dependency. See, we have resources right under our feet, but instead we pay billions to nations that oppose our values, that oppress women, that terrorize people. We can protect the environment without selling our integrity. Uh, I got a biblical conviction of law and order. We honor those who protect and serve, every person. Can we just give it up for every person who protects and serves? Our military, our officers. Nehemiah tells us to fight for our families and we don't defund what keeps our families safe. I got a biblical conviction of education and parental involvement. See, God didn't call me to co-parent with the government. Parents, stay engaged. Teachers, if you're a teacher in here, thank you. We honor you who are holding the front lines there in education. When it comes to issues like gender, parents must be involved in the conversation. When it comes to biblical issues like like globalization, y'all don't know what globalization globalization is, you need to know what globalization is, okay? I'm probably gonna preach on this sometime soon. Listen to that language of a one world government of a one currency. I'm telling you, it's, it's, it's a setup for revelation that warns us when sovereignty is sacrificed, 
See, God established the nations. Oh, I don't have time. Mm. In the Tower of Babel, man tried to come together and not disperse and create in, in the, the, the nations. Man tried to come together under their own rule, dishonoring God's will for it and create their own way to get to God instead of God coming to them. And God said, no, I'm going to disperse you. Man is trying to do that again. I'm telling you, it is, it is demonic globalization. One world order is demonic, and it will be, bring in the Antichrist. According to the Bible, it will bring in. That's a step toward Revelation chapter 13, warning about the Antichrist. When you say the Bible isn't political, just read Revelation. All right? It's a political person. This is, this is, this is more about, like, it's not, a, can I say it like this? It's, this is not about right and left. This is about up and down. It's not about right versus left. This is about the kingdom of heaven in the dominion of hell. And who's going to advance their, their values? This is about more than left and right. It's about light and darkness. It's about truth and deception. See, I don't bow to an elephant and I don't bow to a donkey. I bow to the lion and I bow to the lamb and his name is Jesus. He is King, Lord of Lords. Let me end with this, Joshua 24. Verse 15, is very relevant for us. It was relevant for them in their day. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable for you, then why don't you choose, look, if what I'm telling you today, you're like, I just don't like, I don't, oh, but their personality, I can't stand, and I don't like this about them. Ah, okay, well, if serving the Lord, if you can't serve the Lord in this area of your life, in the political arena, then choose. Choose for yourself this day who you're gonna serve then. Whether the gods of your ancestors, it, it, whether the way your, your parents did it and the way your grandparents did it and what candidates or what, what, what side they were on, go ahead, go ahead. Or the gods of the Amorites, whose land you're living in, the, what's popular around you, the popular opinion, hey, what everyone else is saying and feeding you, go ahead and align with that and serve the, cur the culture. But he says, but as for me, in my household, I've made up my mind. I'm not gonna listen to the culture. I'm not gonna listen to what's popular. I'm not gonna listen to what my parents or grandparents and how they, how they value. No, no, I'm gonna, as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. But our first priority is not to the candidate. Give your vote, please, to the most qualified candidate according to biblical convictions. But you give your heart to the Most High God. Hey, thank you for watching the Discovery Church YouTube channel. Don't stop here. Join the Discovery Online family every Sunday. Subscribe to this channel so you don't miss a single video or live stream event and share it with a friend. You can also support the ministry by clicking the Give button to help us continue to reach people around the world for Jesus Christ. Thank you again for watching. Go love God, love each other, and change the world.